uh, is to carry out a, a simple approximate deoxidation calculation and demonstrate that how one can really calculate the total amount of uh, deoxidizer which are needed. Uh, let us consider which has an annual production of about 7 million metric tons per annum. Okay. And let us say that the size of a heat is about 130 tons. So, that implies that the size of the little or the vessel we are talking about has a capacity of 130 tons. Let us give some typical characteristics or assign some typical characteristics. The initial oxygen O i is about 600 ppm okay, and which if you convert to weight percentage will come out to be 0 0.0 percentage. And then let us assume that we want a kill steel means uh, much of oxygen in it and let the final oxygen present in the steel be of the order of 20 ppm. That means, we removing of 580 ppm of oxygen that is what we are talking about okay? it's equivalent to about 0 0.05. is that in every kg of molten metal, there is about 0 0.58 kg of oxygen and oxygen that we are required to be removed. So, you can imagine with reference to 130 ton little, the amount is going to be really huge and you know if you translate that amount in metric tons per annum of steel production, the total amount of oxygen removed is going to be really enormous, which essentially implies that we require a lot of aluminum uh, to uh, deoxidize the bath. Let us also say that the tip is about 1600 degrees centigrade or 1873 Kelvin and we are considering deoxidation by aluminum only. We are talking about a case of simple deoxidation. So, situation if you calculate If we talk about reaction between aluminum and oxygen now, so this is two atoms of dissolved aluminum reacting with three atoms of dissolved oxygen, which is producing Al 2 or 3. And as I mentioned to you, that as reaction is concerned, total requirement will be dictated by stoichiometry, stoichiometric reaction requirement as well as thermodynamic requirement. Okay. We have two components and we will add them up and this together will give us the net requirement. Stoichiometric requirement essentially can be found out by looking at this particular equation. This tells us that well 27 into 2 that is 54 kg of oxygen uh, sorry ammonia be reacting with 3 into 16 48 uh, kg of oxygen. So, therefore, we have 48 kg of oxygen is equivalent to about 54 kg of aluminum. This figure of 580 p or 0.058 weight percentage, this corresponds to about, let me just look at the figures, this, this corresponds to about 75.5. 4 kg of oxygen in 130 ton heat. Okay. So, we are saying that in we have to reduce. So, this amount is actually, so this much of oxygen really has to be eliminated. So, so many kg of oxygen has to be eliminated and if on the basis of this equation, we can therefore say that the corresponding amount of aluminum which is going to be needed is going to be 75.4 divided by 48 multiplied by 54 and this is going to be something like 84.5 approximately about 84. So, that means, the stoichiometry on the basis of stoichiometry we can say that 84 kg of aluminum is going to be in order to purely to say that we want to reduce the level of oxygen you know by 580 ppm. So, this much of oxygen is going to really correspond to this much of oxygen in terms of kg kilograms in a 130 ton heat. So, for every heat 
the stoichiometry shell requirement is going to be 84 kg, but this is not going to be enough. So, this 84 kg is actually comes here 84 kg. Okay. Now, we have to calculate the thermodynamic requirement and the thermodynamic requirement can be found out by look considering the equilibrium of this particular reaction. And if you write the equilibrium constant, the equilibrium constant for example, we are going to say activity of Al 2 O 3 in the oxide phase divided by if we assume Henry and activity, activity of oxygen cube and activity of aluminum square. We can assume here for the sake of simplicity that the activity is equal to activity of aluminum is equal to Al 2 O 3 is actually equal to 1. So, this can be assigned to be 1 that is we are considering a case of simple deoxidation and now we can make one more drastic assumption that well the Henry and activity can be approximated you know in terms of a wet percentage scale. So, this is going to be really equal to wet percentage of oxygen okay, cube multiplied by wet percentage of oxygen aluminum square. Okay. So, that is what is it is going to be. Now, this K equilibrium which is directly related to minus delta G naught okay, uh, divided by R T exponential can be known from thermodynamic data and the value that I have obtained is K equilibrium is equal to approximately 3.32 into 10 raised to the power minus 13 and inverse of it. So, I am writing the K equilibrium for the forward reaction. If I have to write for the backward reaction, the value of K equilibrium is going to be simply reverse, okay, the inverse sign will vanish and then we will get the value of K equilibrium for the backward reaction. So, if I substitute the value of K equilibrium, what is the final level of oxygen that is already given to us, which is, is equal to 0 0.02002 and then from this particular equation, we should be able to find out that what is wet percentage aluminum and now I go to other side and from this by substituting the value, I can say that wet percentage of aluminum square is going to be equal to 1 inverse 1 by wet percentage of oxygen cube into k. So, now I substitute the value of k equilibrium is equal to this into this expression. I substitute this is equal to 0 0.002 that is what is the final level of oxygen we are talking about k equilibrium we are talking about 3.32 into 10 raise to the power minus 14. This is actually 14, I stand corrected here okay, and this is inverse and then I should be able to calculate what percentage of aluminum and this I think comes out to be equal to 4 into 10 to the power minus 6, which gives me what percentage aluminum in the melt in equilibrium with 0 0.00 2 wet percentage oxygen is equal to 0 0.002 and this turns out this tells me that well the thermodynamically about 2.6 kg of aluminum is needed as far as equilibrium calculation for 130 ton size and this is 230 of aluminum in equilibrium. With 0.002 weight percentage oxygen. So, I come back here, I have already obtained 84 kg approximately 84 kg to be the thermodynamic uh, stoichiometric requirement on the basis of this calculation. So, this figure wet percentage of aluminum is this much. So, I can translate it very easily that in 100 kg I have 0 0.002 kg of aluminum. So, therefore, in a 130 ton heat size or 13 into 10 to the power 4 kg how much of oxygen is going to be there and that oxygen turns out to be is equal to some value uh, that aluminum is going to come out to be 2.6 kg of aluminum. Okay. So, this value incidentally turns out to be same as the value that we have is just mere coincidence okay. uh, nothing beyond that. So, 0 0.002 percent weight percentage of aluminum is there 
in the bath in equilibrium with the same amount of oxygen and this once translated to 130 ton ladle size, we find out that the thermodynamic requirement is actually 2.6 kg of aluminum. Now, we can sum this two up okay, and then tell us that well, the net requirement is going to be approximately 86.6 kg. So, for every 130 ton heat size, we are going to require now 86.6 kg of aluminum, which is to be added. And now, if I translate it to 7 million tons of steel, you can imagine that value, you know, and it is going to come out to be something like, I think 500,000. Approx 5000. So, this is the total requirement for the 7 million tons. For 130 tons of heat, we require 86 kg. So, for 7 million tons of plant production, how much of aluminum is going to be needed, which is equal to 5000, approximately 5000 tons of aluminum. And taking that aluminum is about 2.5 US dollar per ton. Okay this comes out to be approximately 6 lakh rupees in Indian currency. So, this much of oxygen, this much of aluminum, okay, 5000 tons of aluminum will be needed by the 7 million ton steel plant and this 5000 uh, tons of aluminum at the current rate of production consists about 6 lakh uh, rupees or in Indian currency. Now, it is important to note that this assumes that we are adding if we add 5000 tons of aluminum okay, or in a given heat, if we add 86.6 kg of aluminum, that much aluminum is going to be utilized for stoichio as far as stoichiometric and thermodynamic requirement. So, we are not considering any loss of aluminum, but in reality what happens is that we have to add more amount of aluminum, much more than 86.6 kg, because some of the aluminum added is going to be reacting with the atmosphere. What did I say? I said earlier that well, we have a ladle here okay, and that in this particular ladle, we have stream coming in and we are adding aluminum in this way and all the aluminum will be floating here. So, these are going to be my aluminum. So, the aluminum, deoxidizer aluminum which is added to the chute into the melt is going to come to the free surface because of its lesser density and as a result of which this aluminum, a part of it is going to be reacting with the atmosphere as it reacts with the, as it melts and dissolves into the molten steel bath in order to react with the oxygen. So, therefore, it is understood that we have to add more amount of aluminum than is dictated. This is the requirement of the process. So, this requirement, now I can say that well, requirements and what is added divided by what, what is added determines the efficiency of utilization efficiency of utilization okay and so requirement is how much requirement is 86.6 kg but we are going to add more than 86.6 kg and as a result of which the efficiency of utilization is going to be less than equal to 1 now for buoyant additions like aluminum etc the recovery rate or the efficiency of utilization is significantly smaller than 1 it is about 60 to 70 percent in general processes as a result of which you can enhance these values you know by about 30 percent or so. So, the 6 lakhs of money that I am showing here could translate to something about 10 lakhs 12 lakhs of rupees per annum. So, the calculation has indicated that large tonnage of aluminum is required in steel plants when we are going to produce uh, low oxygen steel or kill steel and we have also noted that you know uh, huge expenses are involved as a result of the large tonnage of aluminum and therefore, there is considerable interest in the industry to minimize uh, the wastage of aluminum. I have also mentioned that the efficiency of utilization which is which we also term in the industry as recovery, uh, the recovery of aluminum because of its wastage, its reaction with the ambient and other you know of sometimes if you in the process uh, gives us a small value much lower than 1. So, quite a bit of aluminum is going to be uh, wasted, which will not take part into uh, the deoxidation reaction at all. So, uh, industrialists have been concerned uh, by for improving the recovery uh, rate of aluminum and 
you know, in much older times, uh, many other processes uh, like uh, bullet shooting methods, uh, etcetera, were uh, devised. As I have indicated earlier, that typically bulk of the additions, aluminum additions, will be made through the chute. Okay, it is going to be dropped through a chute, pointing to the region where the stream from the furnace is entering into the ladle or the impact zone, such that the aluminum can be a drained subsurface. So the scientists knew that we have to somehow keep the aluminum submerged and then only uh, we can improve the recovery of aluminum. We have to stop uh, the contact of aluminum with the slag or with the environment and aluminum has to come in contact directly with the metal. So, therefore, it has to be main, it has to remain subsurface and earlier many time years back people used to you know introduce a method which is typically called which of course is obsolete now. There are better methods I am going to tell you bullet shooting methods and this basically uh, were devised you know in which you have a big gun through which huge aluminum bullets point you know which is like cylinder conical shapes they are going to be injected into the or pumped into the molten metal or molten steel and people used to think that if you if you if you can shoot the bullet of aluminum with a very high speed it has a potential to penetrate deep inside the bath as a result of which the, <coughs> the recovery of aluminum can be increased because it can really go inside the subsurface today uh, apart from bulk alloy additions of aluminum uh, we have wire feeding of aluminum which is very popular okay and this is basically done uh, in order to uh, improve the recovery or efficiency of utilization uh, of aluminum for example uh, the aluminum wears if you have a melting level okay so you have a porous plug here you have a porous plug here through which argon is going to be injected okay and once you have you have a coil here through which the aluminum wire comes and it is you know so this is basically a roll which rotates and this is the aluminum wire So, you have a huge <laughs> coil from which through pulley the aluminum wire is drawn something like this. Okay. So, this is the coil of aluminum wire. These are basically essentially coated aluminum wire. So, it is going to be fed into the bath at a very high speed. Now, as I mentioned earlier that is a solid one solid object which is being entering into the molten metal. So, therefore, a solid crust is going to be formed around the wire okay, as it enters. So, this is a solidified crust and then the crust melts back and at this particular moment maybe you can think that jet of aluminum is going to be issued and this jet of aluminum because of its buoyancy is going to rise up and these droplets of aluminum are then going to dissolve uh, into the bath whereby they can react with dissolved oxygen producing aluminum. So, the efficiency of utilization is more reproducible, more reproducible and uh, the efficiency of utilization or the recovery is also significantly more than the uh, you know bulk addition that is typically practiced and that I have been talking about uh, all along uh, this lecture. There is another process also which is known as the cas -OB process and this process uh, is again an, another version of the argon star ladle. So, the material has been poured into the ladle uh, from the furnace and now what happens is if you, if you look at uh, the process it goes something like this. So, we have a snorkel here and we have the porous plug somewhere here. So, so from the porous plug you have bubbles which are going out and this is the melt here. So, we have basically the slag layer which is contained outside this snorkel. So, this is an inert chamber basically and we have the melt surface here and this region this is slag and here there is no slag as you would note here. So, therefore, the bubbles rise here within the central part there is large velocity there because the gas is rising through this snorkel there is an inert atmosphere here there is no oxygen because the argon bubbles are argon gas is going to be there and through this chute alloys like aluminum etcetera are going to be introduced into the melt. Now, once you introduce aluminum through this we must understand 
looking at the figure that aluminum will have no chance to come in contact with the slag. Okay. And also, aluminum even though it may, might float on the free surface, we may see that the aluminum blocks are here really, okay. but see, because I do not have oxygen in the atmosphere, this environment is really filled up with inert uh, gas or argon gas. So, therefore, what we will see that the buoyant additions which are going to be introduced into the cast OB process will have a greater potential okay, uh, to react with the molten metal, dissolve into the molten metal, then reacting with uh, uh, oxygen as would happen in a typical uh, conventional uh, furnace trapping uh, operation. So, cast OB process, it is now well known in the industry that it gives rise to much more better recovery rate of aluminum, even when people are adding you know sometimes recarburization of steel. So, to get the maximum utilization of graphite, this is a technique which normally people uses. This is a very efficient method for introduction of buoyant alloying additions. So, I will stop about the oxidation at this particular moment and now I am going to go into the second topic which is the lethal metallurgy. But before I start lethal metallurgy, I would like to bring to your notice the significance of lethal metallurgy for example. Now, I have been talking about uh, you know also that primary steel making, uh, we produce crude steel which contains lot of impurities and uh, the duration of primary steel making of course, will vary depending on the capacity of the converter 30 minutes, 28 minutes, 50 minutes something like that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, secondary steel making or little metallurgy involves a variety of processes. There is not just one process, steel is being treated once the little is filled by molten metal from the furnace. Then the secondary steel making or lead metallurgy operation starts. Okay. And the objective of lead metallurgy or various lead metallurgy operations can be several. One we say the commonly is inert gas stirring. This is one aspect of I will explain to you what is the necessity of this. Then we have injection metallurgy we may inject something. We may have heating and we may have degassing basically and also we have various specialized processes, special processes. like AOD and VOD, which is termed as argon oxygen decarburization and vacuum oxygen decarburization. As you all know that stainless steel for example, uh, contains very little amount of uh, carbon. Uh, we do not want carbon, because if you have carbon, then chromium carbide segregates in the quality of stainless steel uh, is uh, deteriorates uh, significantly, uh, deteriorates significantly. So, we require low carbon uh, and when you produce stainless steel, there are special specialized techniques to decarburize the bath and these are the two techniques. So, a variety of processes uh, are really uh, fall within the domain of uh, lethal metallurgy and the duration of all this put together can be much, much longer than the duration of primary steel making operation. We must understand that if we try to in introduce or uh, treat steel through all these processes, okay, the cost of steel is going to be extremely large. Now, therefore, for every grade of steel produced, all these treatments are not going to be justified. Okay. We may just do inert gas stirring and heating for a common grade of steel, but for a specialized grade of rail steel, which does not tolerate too much of hydrogen for example, in that case on top of these two, we may be you know interested to carry out degassing processes, because degassing is a process to drive out dissolved, mol dissolved gases from molten metal. So, the more and more secondary steel making processes are going to be incorporated in the steel making circuitry. We will see that the duration of production is going to be longer, steel production is going to be longer as a result of which the productivity of the plant is going to go down and it is compensated by obviously raising the price of steel. So, therefore, and a steel produced by simply inert gas stirring and little heating is going to be less priced than steel treated by you know inert gas stirring with heating and degassing combined itself. And as it is to be noted that for every grade of steel, 
all these treatments are not justified. We have to understand uh, or we have to know the specification of the customer, what the customer wants and based on that we are going to select that whatever are the processes which are necessary uh, to be encompassed in the domain of learning metallurgy operation. In our guest starring, let me briefly introduce these terms. Essentially tells about introduction of argon gas into molten steel. Why we use argon? Because we must understand that we are now continuously refining steel. We are producing, we have removed decarburization, reduced crude steel, we have removed oxygen, we are going to take out subsequent operations. So, at this particular stage, we really do not want to contaminate. We cannot, we do not need oxygen. For example, we have, there is nothing to burn there, no silicon oxidation or phosphorus oxidation is necessary. If you introduce nitrogen okay, to start the contents of the ladle, in that case what happens steel is going to be rich in nitrogen that is also not desirable. So, basically we are going to introduce argon into the ladle. So, during the ladle metallurgy treatment all along this processes the material in the vessel needs to be continuously stirred. We require stirring here. Without stirring the rate of the metallurgical processes are going to be or the chemical processes are going to be very, very small because we know that steel making reactions are basically mass transport control reactions and mass transport control reactions have a tremendous influence on the fluid dynamics of the reactor. So, therefore, in the absence of any stirring, we will not see uh, much rate of uh, the chemical reactions or noticeable rate of the chemical reactions. That is why we need stirring and gas stirring as I have already mentioned is the cheapest mode of stirring. And we require inert gas stirring because the inert gas is not going to contaminate molten metal. At every stage from now onwards, we are going to ensure the steel does not get contaminated either from the environment or with the refractory or with you know introduction of foreign material and so on. So, inert gas stirring is an essential part of ladle metallurgy. The objective is to continuously start the contents of the bath such that thermal homogenization, material homogenization, chemical reactions, inclusion flotation, this can all operate with its maximum uh, efficiency. Next comes injection metallurgy. Injection metallurgy talks about injecting some powder through an auxiliary lens into the molten uh, steel. What is the objective of injection metallurgy? For example, we may use some reagents to control the morphology of inclusion. Okay? We may uh, use uh, some powder material also into the molten metal to say uh, increase the rate of desulphurization. So, there are many objectives and injection metallurgy is very popular which essentially tells of injection of solids or in the powder form into molten metal. Powder form we use because then the surface area is more which essentially implies that the rate of reaction is going to be more. And injection metallurgy is very popular in the context of inclusion morphology change, in the context of uh, desulphurization and so on. Next comes heating which is also called as LF operations. In this case, the ladle is going to be as I will show you later, the ladle is going to be converted into a ladle furnace, whereby just like the way we heat molten metal in an electric or scrap in an electric arc furnace, see in the same manner electrodes are going to be you know submerged into the stop slag layer and it is basically an arc heating process that is essential for uh, the heating purpose. Now, why do we need heating? We must understand that we have tapped the molten metal at 1600 degree centigrade for example. Now, having tapped the material at 1600 degree centigrade, lot of heat is going to be lost to the wall, through this wall, through this wall and possibly significant amount of heat will be lost to the top surface, okay? because the top surface is a slack cover. These are all refractory covered, so as a result of which we will see tremendous amount of heat is going to be lost. Now, if heat is going to be lost, so and that the duration of secondary steel making or little metallurgy is substantially more. So, we can encompass, we can envisage that the, that, the, the, that the total drop in temperature because of such heat loss during the process are going to be really considerably high. Now, typically you know during the holding period of a ladle, it is known that about 0 0.5 degrees okay, per minute. This is the rate 5 degrees centigrade per minute this is the rate at which the temperature drops during the holding period. Also, we must understand that in the secondary steel making or level metallurgy uh, operations, we may be used 
we may be using different solid reactants, we may be forming slags, we may be injecting some solid species or we may be adding some alloying additions to adjust the composition of the steel. These alloying additions, the dissolution of lime for making fresh slag etcetera are going to consume heat, these are all endothermic processes and where from the heat is going to come, the heat is going to be taken away from the metal and as a result of which the metal temperature will drop significantly. But remember that the downstream process is the continuous casting process, where we require a fixed temperature. So, we have tapped the molten metal at 1600 degrees centigrade. If you do not do heating and carry out all these operations, by the time the material goes to continuous casting uh, bay, it is going to be considerably chilled, may be prematurely solidify as well. So, somewhere in between the circuitry of regular metallurgy, we do require that a heating operation be done and this heating operation basically compensates for heat loss as well as heat required for many endothermic processes which are carried out under little metallurgy steel making conditions. And as I said, there is electrode heating, the same principle as arc heating in an electric arc furnace uh, is being applied and I am going to show you later this you know a nice drawing of a little furnace. How do you convert this little into a little furnace that will be very clear uh, when you show you the electrode etcetera. And there you will come to know that why this porous plug is really located of the center and not immediately below on the central line. Okay, it is shifted uh, either towards the left or it is offset basically. Why it is so that will be clear when you talk about the little furnace. Following heating, we have degassing process and degassing basically is removal of gases. We have as I mentioned to you, now the molten metal might contain lot of nitrogen where from nitrogen has come, nitrogen has basically come during the tapping and entering of the tapping stream into the ladle. So, the furnace in the furnace we are using basic oxygen furnace we are using oxygen okay. and now that when you are tilting the furnace and we are filling up the ladle that during that process what happens is the molten steel draws falling molten steel stream draws lot of surrounding air which contains lot of nitrogen as a result of which the material contained in ladle will contain lot of nitrogen. Also, depending on the quality of the raw material use, lime etcetera contains lot of moisture and also there are lot of leakages in the many plants also as you can see. So, there is sporadic contact you know with, with water vapor and so which gives rise to significant amount of hydrogen sometimes even 3 ppm, 4 ppm. So, nitrogen and hydrogen which are there in the steel can be driven out by degassing and as I will show later on the degassing is most effective under vacuum or under reduced pressure condition. So, to produce quality steel that does not contain much of dissolved gases, oxygen we have removed by deoxidation and whatever little nitrogen and hydrogen are there in the melt that can be uh, removed uh, by the vacuum treatment of steel and specialized processes as I said the names are clear argon oxygen decarburization because when you decarburize the bath we have we inject argon and oxygen together and this argon and oxygen okay, uh, helps with the decarburization of the bath. The oxygen injected reacts with carbon produces some heat and also carbon monoxide and this is again uh, vacuum oxygen decarburization because you have the reaction dissolve oxygen and dissolve carbon and we know that smaller is the partial pressure of carbon larger is the tendency of the reaction to go from left to right. So, we will be able to produce a low carbon steel, extremely low carbon steel if you are operating at a low pressure and this is the essence of vacuum oxygen decarburization. So, now I am going to discuss about inert gas stirring in detail and since the steel is now sitting in the ladle, uh, we will talk first about the construction uh, of a ladle which is very important for us to understand. So, if you look at uh, the ladle, uh, it really looks like a cylindrical shaped vessel. So, this is the section, longitudinal sectional value and uh, I draw that this is So, let us see that this is the view of the base. Basically, this little is uh, contained in a steel shell, this outer shell is steel and then we have uh, 
lot of uh, refractory materials. For example, we can have uh, refractory tiles here, we can have papers here, lot of ramming materials here, which constitute the permanent lining. And then, we have finally, the layer of this is going to be the refractory bricks. And there are different kinds of bricks, with which this is really, uh, this we have steel plate, we have refractory tiles, we have refractory papers, and then we have So, these are the bricks. Now, the bricks are not of uniform type here. That means, there is a gradation of bricks uh, depending on the requirements. Uh, we can see that if we take the longitudinal cross section, maybe there is this is where we have uh, the porous plug which is located, and then we have we have to drain molten metal out and we have a well also at the bottom. Now, this is steel shell. Typically, we will see that the ladle is going to be filled up with some steel with this particular height and then we may have a slag layer which is there. So, this is going to be called as the free board of the ladle. So, this distance is free board. Okay? Otherwise, if we do not have free board, then what happens? If we translate the ladle, because the ladle is to be moved from one place to another, what happens? The molten steel is going to flow out of the ladle. So, significant some amount of free board, 60 centimeters, 70 centimeters, it varies from plant to plant is uh, necessary. So, molten steel is there. On top of molten steel, we have slag layer and this slag, as I repeat again, is not the oxidizing slag of the furnace. This slag has been prepared afresh. It is by the addition of lime as well as spar materials, silica uh, in the ladle during the filling operation. And also, now it contains lot of alumina also, because we have added aluminum uh, to deoxidize the bath. So, alumina, uh, CaO, SiO 2, this is basically the composition of the slag. Now, this lining, which is there on the freeboard, is not critical for us, because this is not subjected uh, to much of hydrodynamic erosion. Mostly, the chemical and hydrodynamic erosions are going to be there over this surfaces. Okay. These are the surface, which are going to be attacked severely by molten metal and slag. And this zone, basically, we can divide roughly. This is the freeboard zone. And then, we can say that there is the slag zone. And then, we have this metal zone. The slag attacks refractory vigorously, depending on the composition of the slag. And if you particularly have little bit of iron oxide, that is detrimental uh, for the slag, because iron oxide impregnates into the refractory brick. So, the corrosive to you know to, to minimize the corrosive attack of brick uh, refractory on the brick, the slag zone material is basically it is a Mac coke, MG coke, Mac coke brick. On the other hand, this part is going to be basically primarily alumina brick. If you look at the cross section, then what happens is, we see at the base, we have this is the well here and this is the porous plug here. So, this is porous plug and this is the well. Okay. And below this, we may have a slight gate. I am going to maybe you know or I am going to talk talk about it later. The slide gate controls uh, the flow out of the ladle. Okay. This ladle is going to be taken to continuous casting. It is going to feed a tan dish and therefore, we have to take out molten metal. So, through this porous plug as we introduce gas, it is through this well, we are going to be taking out molten metal. Typically, during the process, this remains closed uh, by using some refractory or ramming uh, material and so on. And somewhere here, we must understand this is the region which you should plan that when the molten steel, molten steel steam from the uh, furnace enters the ladle, it is here that the stream really impinges. If the steel impinges here or here, there is going to be significant damage to the ladle. We do not want porous plug or the well region to come directly under the falling stream. 
the pin is going to be falling on this. So, there is going to be a different kind of a refractory material, you know, in this particular region, because the impact of the stream is going to be really severe. So, extremely large hydrodynamic erosion can be expected in this particular region, where the stream is falling. So, this is the BOF stream striking stream striking region. And this region needs to be reinforced properly with the refractory material. Now, the plug as I have shown here, this plug is typically located as if you look at this, if this represents the R value, this is located at zero, rough, roughly about 0. So, 50 percent of the bath radius position or I we say that the porous plug is located typically at mid bath radius uh, position. The number of porous plug for example, uh, may be 1 or 2 depending on the size of the ladle. In many ladles of bigger capacity like 200 tons, 250 tons and so on, we can have twin porous plugs and in this case you know the porous plugs could be located diametrically opposite or they could be lo displaced uh, located in the adjacent uh, quadrant and the whole arrangement has to be uh, re, re you know restructured when you have twin porous plug then what I have indicated in this particular figure. Now, argon is going to be injected through the porous plug and as I mentioned to you that the flow rate of argon will determine the extent of agitation. Now, we have a diverse range of argon flow rate and the typical argon flow rate can go from 0.1 normal meter cube per hour per ton of steel to about 0 point or 10 times more. So, 1 normal meter cube, let us say n normal meter cube per hour per ton. So, this is the range of little metallurgy steel making argon flow rates and this flow rates as you would note is significantly smaller than the flow rates in an oxygen steel making process. Now, let us look at when you introduce gases what happens. So, if you when you introduce gas, argon gas through the bottom, okay, this argon gas rises, because the gas has buoyancy, just like the way you would see that you have a long, uh, if you go to a thermal power plant for example, you will see a big long chimney and through the chimney uh, the smoke comes out and that is called a smoke plume, which rises vertically upwards, because it is lighter, it is at higher temperature. In this case, the gas is lighter than that of steel. So, as a result of which the gas rises through the molten steel, because of its buoyancy and this region we say that it is a argon liquid steel plume region. So, argon plus steel plume. Let me give you a clarified picture now, having given you the design and the refractory features, let us not draw about it. So, I have the little here, I have the porous plug here, I inject argon and what I see is a region here through which bubbles. This is the slag layer. So, this is slag and this is my refractory lined ladle. And this is molten metal, molten steel, and this is what I am talking about. So, we can expect that as the gas is issued from the porous plug, uh, we will have the gases rises, and as the gases rises, what happens is it draws along with it molten steel metal and as a result of which it creates an intense kind of a flow within the system. Also, the gas has to leave to the surrounding or go, go back to the surrounding and this is typically called the slag eye or the plume eye. Through, uh, through this, the argon bubbles really escape to the surrounding. Now, you see uh, there is a very interesting aspect of argon stirring operation is that we have oxygen here and this metal contains no oxygen, no dissolved oxygen. We have taken away all the oxygen uh, by the addition of deoxidizer elements. Now, 
as the slag I is being created, what happens here? We have molten metal which comes in direct contact with atmospheric oxygen. So, as a result of which oxygen gets dissolved, because oxygen has extreme solubility in molten steel, weight affinity of oxygen with iron and as a result of which at this high temperature, lot of oxygen passes into the molten steel and this oxygen, once it gets into molten steel, what happens is it starts reacting with aluminum which is dissolved in steel and you know the aluminum fading uh, starts and as a result of which the slag becomes progressively richer in iron oxide. And this is a very important aspect which we call as a reoxidation of steel. So, if we are looking for quality steel, this reoxidation must be prevented to the extent possible, particularly towards the later stage of level metallurgy steel making operation. The porous plug are basically refractory materials, because a part of it is in contact with molten metal as I have tried to indicate in this figure. So, they can be either pressed or they can be cast, both the ways they can be produced. They can have random pores and they can have directional directional or directed pores. Some of them have slots also by which gases gases are delivered into uh, the molten metal. Now, the precise nature in argon stirring operation, argon injection operation, the precise nature of the pores etcetera really does not uh, influence much about uh, much the flow field which is generated in the system, because the size of the bubbles which are generated in the system is dictated by thermophysical properties, because the pore is a small. A typically, a big gas, en gas, en gas envelope forms here okay, and this gas shatters into a number of uh, bubbles and these bubbles rise and the size of these bubbles are dictated by the thermophysical properties of the melt rather than by the details of the pores and you know whether they are directional or random. So, this has virtually no role to play and the flow recirculation or the intensity of flow which is produced here depends on the flow rate rather than the characteristics of gas injection. So, that means, if you are injecting gas per se for the sake of the statement I am making, instead of a porous plug, if I would introduce the same amount of gas through a say two air, it is going to produce the same amount of more or less the same amount of recirculation. So, therefore, the details of the nozzle design for argon injection into lead is not of not much critical. It is only important for us to know that we require this refractory material which needs can sustain for a long time. We cannot afford to replace this porous plug every hit. So, it has to sustain 8 hits, 10 hits, 12 hits depending on the requirement and we have uh, various techniques, you know they have different uh, performances as far as uh, argon injection is considered. So, we can have two plugs, we can have one plug, one plug would be used for typically 50 ton, 100 ton, 130 ton size little, two plugs would be used when we are talking about 300 tons or 500 tons little size and so on. And we are using a variety of range of gas flow rates. This depends on the objective of argon stirring operation and the objective of argon stirring operation I would say could be one is homogenization and homogenization means we are talking about mixing. Okay. So, if you add if you add a spoon of sugar into a cup of tea, in that case you got to stir it and this is called the material homogenization. You are otherwise what is going to happen if you do not stir it? You will sip the tea and see the first sip does not contain much sugar, whereas the last tea that you are going to drink will contain lot of uh, sugar and that is because of the inhomogeneities of sugar distribution in the cup of tea. So, argon rinsing basically is carried out to homogenize the bath in terms of its temperature, in terms of its composition. So, we would have as a result of our homogenization or argon rinsing same amount of oxygen or same amount of nitrogen or same amount of silicon uh, everywhere, we are going to have same temperature also more or less you know in the system not much difference. So, thermally and materially uh, it can be homogenized by argon injection. So, second objective of argon injection, so this is basically homogenization which is called in industry or shop floor as a rinsing operation. Then we have in 
heating operation, we can have uh, arcing or a flow rate uh, during composition adjustment. So, and we can have desulphurization also, slag metal reaction. slag metal reaction. When you are talking of rinsing, basically this is the final stage of argon rinsing. That means, all treatments are over. We are going to now give uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, a little gentle stirring into it and we require a very small flow rate, so that the eyes become small and there is not much scope of reoxidation of the metal. Arcing, which is the heating operation basically we are talking about. At that particular moment, we are going to add lot of alloying additions which has to dissolve, the flow rate is going to be a little bit higher and for desulphurization we require extensive amount of slag metal mixing in the system which is carried out during the beginning of the argon rinsing operation immediately following deoxidation in that case the flow rate could be very very high. So, the flow rate that I have quoted for 1 normal meter cube per hour per ton basically corresponds to about corresponds to the desulphurization process in little on the other hand 0.1 normal meter cube per hour per ton corresponds to the rinsing operation and somewhere around 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 normal meter cube per hour per ton would correspond to the alloy dissolution or uh, making the chemistry right during the little arcing operation such that material and heat are distributed evenly in the system. So, all little techniques have one thing in common, they in one way or other uses argon which is injected from the bottom of the level. The objective of argon injection is to start the contents of the level, which can aid in thermal homogenization, material homogenization, chemistry adjustment, inclusion flotation and many other allied aspects of steel making. Now, before I proceed further, I would like to talk about little bit about the initial part of uh, little uh, pretreatment. That means, when we bring the ladle below the basic oxygen furnace uh, to tap the contents of the furnace into the ladle, the ladle requires to be preheated and the preheating uh, is basically carried out in gas fired furnace preheating of ladle. So, you can imagine if you look at the ladle, the ladle is I have drawn the ladle so far as a perfect cylinder, but please note that the ladles are rarely perfectly cylinder, they are about marginally tapered. My drawing may not be that good, but this tapering we are talking about in ladle is about 5 to 7 degrees. So, the refractory line ladle is put in this particular position and then it is sealed with a cover and in this cover we have holes and there are burners so these are burners and as a result of which there is convection and radiation of heat. In this chamber, okay. so before we take the ladle to uh, for a tapping operation, the ladle is going to be preheated and this is basically, this is a cover really refractory cover and there are holes and we burn gases, this is gas fired burners and as a result of this burning of the gases here, we generate enormous amount of heat and the heat is going to be converted and radi radiatively distributed all over and as a result of which the ladle is going to be preheated. Now, typical preheating time can, several, can go from several for several hours depending on the size of the ladle. By the by, what could be the size of the ladle? I have myself seen plants like you know 30 ton size ladle, where they have small little electric arc furnace. I have also seen plants which are about 500 ton BOF, 
so the level sizes can vary enormously. 30 ton size you can imagine about 1 meter diameter you know uh, to about 500 ton size level which could be about 4 meter diameter. So, it is an enormous difference in size and accordingly you know the amount of refractory which is used will be significantly different amount of the, the, the duration of reheating uh, or preheating is going to be also significantly different. Several hours will be needed to preheat you know, and basically we go up to 1200, 1100 to 1200 degrees centigrade and once uh, it is done uh, the ladle is ready and then the tapping operation uh, can initiate because otherwise if you take a cold ladle and pour the hot metal from the blast uh, from the BOF what is going to happen you know there is going to be enormous uh, impact uh, on the uh, loss of temperature or loss of heat and as a result of which we will form solidified skull bulk many much of material will be solidified over the refractory lining. So, never ever steel is going to be poured in a uh, molten in a uh, uh, un unheated uh, level. Okay. So, this is the porous plug and this gives us the complete picture. Now, there is another term which I want to introduce which is called the recycling of ladle which I have briefly mentioned recycling of ladle. I want to give you some figure. The recycle of ladle implies that we have from the furnace we have a preheated ladle okay. it goes to ladle metallurgy or we say secondary steel making from there. So, the tapping operation can be if you are casting you know tapping may be about 8 tons 7 tons per minute or something like that. In that case you can fill up uh, the ladle in less than uh, 10 minutes if it is a 50 ton size. So, we are talking about 5 to 10, 10 to 15 minutes time duration here for the tapping operation furnace could be about again 30 40 minutes and then little metallurgy duration here could be about 60 70 minutes and once all the secondary steel making operations are over assuming that we require degassing uh, lf operations little furnace operations or heating operations uh, injection metallurgy everything then we go to the continuous casting the same ladle travels to continuous casting bay and then the empty ladle is brought here empty, but it is a red hot level red hot because it was containing. So, this is actually called the cycling of the level. How many times a level can uh, move in this cycle? It depends on maybe 70 hits, it can go up to 125 hits that is what the figures that I have from my own experience with particularly the Indian steel industry. Okay. So, after 125 hits or 70 hits uh, you know the life is we say that the life of the ladle is now over because there has been tremendous amount of erosion of lining, tremendous amount of uh, skull formation uh, and therefore, the ladle necessitates some kind of a relining exercise. In that case what happens this uh, the working lining is going to be replaced and new bricks are going to be put uh, depending on the requirements uh, of specific regions as I have mentioned uh, earlier. So, To sum up now, I will in lateral metallurgy we are going to introduce lot of argon through the through the porous plug. The argon will start the contents. The objective of lateral metallurgy is to enhance the composition and cleanliness of steel. Cleanliness is a very important parameter which I have not so far talked about. Uh, in this course, we will come across this term repeatedly towards the later part and divide of inclusions, removal of inclusions, uh, modification of inclusions, these are extremely important. So, the objective it is really the value addition goes in secondary steel making or in barrel metallurgy operations. It is the heart of today's uh, steel plant activities because this is where the quality of steel is harnessed to the maximum possible extent. We have virtually you know when you talk about the high grade automotive steel, high grade pipeline steels. Okay. These are the steels which have no impurities, 
very tight compositions with no casting defects and so on and that foundation is laid in the level metallurgy area itself.